doing tonight, we're going to get started in the Bible study in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. It's on. Is it working? It shows that it's working. Let me make this announcement while they're checking the sound. Oklahoma Baptist Women's Retreat. It's at Falls Creek, but because of the cough cough, you can also stream it. And so the Baptist Church in Barnsdall has paid for the streaming rights, and they're going to stream it. And then we uh, invited ourselves and asked if we could just come and help them. And so we're going to we're going to uh, try to take as many women as we can. And it'll be in the beautiful sanctuary of Barnesville First Baptist. You've never been there. It's beautiful. And it'll be streamed there. And then uh, we're going to help them with the cost of that. And then the men, the mighty macho men of Matoka, have volunteered to cook dinner for the ladies and serve it. And so, and clean up. So if that's not a bunch of angels flying too close to the ground, I'll eat your hat. And so we just want to be uh, servants, and we want to be uh, a blessing to the ladies, the ladies here, and the ladies there. And so that is April the 17th. It's on a Saturday night, and I have scanned this thing, and I have looked on the website, and it does not say what time. But I would guess somewhere probably 7 o'clock or something like that. So... We'll probably have dinner before, and um, but anyway, you be thinking about that. And then if you'll do this for me, you ladies, um, if you would pray, and I'll lay this over here so you can check it out. If you would pray and ask God to lay a lady on your heart, and then you would offer to bring her, that would be great. And uh, we talked about this morning being servants. And we need to quit talking about it and start doing it, okay? And tonight we're going to talk about your ministry, okay? Now remember the Bible talks about Jesus. And it says before the one that ascended. Who ascended? It was Jesus. It says before the one that ascended, before that he did descend. And he came up out of hell and he, and he took captivity captive. And then, and then it starts in a really weird couple of verses. It says, and he gave gifts to men. You think that's strange. And these gifts were pastors. So I've said this before. So, hey, look up here. This is your gift. And uh, some people would like to exchange their gift into something that fits them. Uh, but I, I'm sorry, this is your gift. And uh, some pastors, some evangelists, some prophets, on and on and on. Apostles. And then it says something really strange that nobody ever points out. For the perfecting of the saints. That's what a preacher is to do. And the word perfecting doesn't mean to make you guys sinless, but to grow you up and mature you. That's, that's what all the, the, the gifts of the ministry are for. For what? For the growing up or the maturing of the saints. And then the verse says this. For the ministry of the edification of the church. So it's really not my job to do all the ministry here. My ministry is to help you in your ministry. Now you might say, well, I don't have no ministry. That's either because you're rebellious or ignorant. And you might be a little of both. You do have a ministry if you're born again. You've been called into a glorious ministry. Now that's not to say you don't stink at it. You might be the worst one on your block. But if you've been called and you've been born of God's seed, it's for a purpose. You ever think about that? Why? When, he, uh, when he birthed you to new life, why not just take you home then? Well, he left you here that you might be effective, that you might be an ambassador for a kingdom that's not here. That you might be a representation of the kingdom of God here. 
And you may not ever stand in a pulpit, but you may minister more than anybody in a pulpit. I always tell these guys that I do funerals for in town, stumps and Arnmore and Nick, I always tell them, you guys have the opportunity to minister to more people in a week's time than any preacher in town. Because they have a captive audience and they're always hurting. And they're already, always thinking about eternity. Well, what, that's a setup for anyone in the ministry. And I'm going to tell you, some of those guys, they, they take it serious. They're not all just creepy people, you know, waiting for you to die. Some of them take that as a calling, and we got some good ones in town. But you have a ministry, and the quicker you figure that out, the quicker you might begin to flow in it. I shared with you this morning a little bit about what happened to me this week. I, I couldn't share it all. I don't know if I'll ever be able to. But I want to share with you before we get started a story that I was told. An old preacher that some of us know, he tells his story. He's passed on now. But he said in the 60s he was a young evangelist. And um, if you will, Casey, will you find um, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 and 14? Thank you. And uh, he said he was in the south, in the deep south, West Virginia or something like that. And he was there to hold a, a revival for a church. And um, this revival had had him planned and booked for a year. And so when he got there, you know, back then they used to always stay in the preacher's home. Now, you know, the evangelists are too good and you got to put them up in the Hilton and all that stuff. But anyway, back in the good old days, and he said the preacher said... Um, on Saturday before the revival was to start, he said, hey, uh, he said, I want to take you over uh, to Katie, uh, Katie, uh, what was her last name? Stitchin, Katie Stitchin's house. And Pastor Ruck, Ruckman said, okay, who's she? He said, well, she's, she's, the, she's the backbone of this church. She's the prayer warrior of this church. And uh, he said, oh, okay, that'd be cool to meet her. He said, Katie Stitchin was in a um, car accident when she was 17 or 18 years old. And she's been paralyzed from her chest down for over 60 years. And for over 60 years, she's laid in a bed with 24-hour care. But Katie Stitchin wouldn't let that keep her down. And so she said, I can't do anything else for God, but I can pray. And he said, you ain't never met a person like this lady. He said, she prays for this church and she's been praying for you for over a year for this revival. Well, Dr. Ruckman said, well, I'd like to meet her. That'd be cool. And so Dr. Ruckman tells the story that he got to her house and the caretaker said, come right this way, take her to, your bed to her bedroom. And Dr. Ruckman, he was not a charismatic, he was not a flighty Pentecostal, he is an old Baptist preacher. He was such a hardline Baptist, the Southern Baptist kicked him out. He said when they opened the door on her bedroom, he went to walk in her bedroom and she was laying over there on the bed. And he said he could not walk in the room. And he fell to his face. And you can believe it or not, but he said he crawled on his hands and knees to her bedside and he couldn't raise his head. And he said, I stuck my hand up and she took my hand and he said, I've never heard a prayer like that. And when she was through praying, this old saint said, Amen. And Dr. Ruckman said, I thought I would stand on my feet and walk out of the room and I could not stand to my feet and he said I crawled on my hands and knees and laid prostrate let me show you this verse it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one 
to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. So I, since Scott gave me this verse, I went over and over and over and over because I'm a little, just a little bit OCD. They were making one sound. That's what I wanted so much this morning, and that's that's what we got a taste of this morning. We were all singing in unison. I, it, it's, it was amazing. You should have been up here. So, so don't let that get by you. They were making one sound in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, man, don't you feel sorry for the church of Christ? And praise the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud. Then the house was filled with a cloud. The cloud was not there just because they were there. And we can gather over and over and over, and the cloud will never be here unless we're in one. Then the house was filled with a cloud. Even the house of the Lord. Now, listen. I've been at this a long time. I just look at it. I've been at this a long time. I've been in churches, and the church was, for the most part, in one accord. But it had one black sheep. And I'm, I, I'm just here to tell you the truth. That one black sheep, I knew who it was. But it ain't my job to run off black sheep. And I've watched God work. And sometimes He doesn't work as fast as you'd like. But the reason why is because He's merciful. Sometimes we're not. But I've watched the Spirit in a church, not just here, in other churches. It would be stifled. It would be drastically hindered and you knew it was because maybe of one person who wasn't on board with the spirit of god i've watched god work and eradicate that problem and the spirit would change i've had people in this church when that has happened a few times since i've been here they come in and they look around what did you do? I said, what do you mean? It just smells fresher in here. It just feels different. I said, well, just sit down and enjoy it while you can. <laughs> so then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Now watch this verse. 14. Sorry, having sound issues. No problem. We got it all night. So that, now this cloud filled the house of the Lord because they were all in one. So, and, and don't forget that point, they were singing praises to God and thanking Him, right? So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now, it's not cheap. If, if it ever happens to you, uh, you'll never forget it. You can live decades off of it. But if it's never happened to you, just seek God uh, and pray. Um, and I, I pray one day that it happens here in this church. I think the battery... Now this thing. There, turn it back on. So... I, and I want to say this. So we're in 2 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to look about you guys' ministry tonight. Not focus so much on mine. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses starting in verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not. So... We, they have a ministry, you have a ministry, watch this. But have renounced the hidden things 
of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness. If you would realize tonight that you too are called into some kind of a ministry. If nothing else, that you would be a witness for Jesus Christ. No matter where you go, no matter where you work, no matter where God takes you, your ministry would be that you'd be a witness for Christ. You'd be available if Christ needed you to share a witness with someone or to help someone or be a blessing to someone. That's a ministry. But what you're doing is you're walking on purpose. You're living on purpose. You're looking with spiritual eyes, where can I minister? You're not thinking about, well, I have a minister. I hear that all the time. My minister. And I just want to puke. What does that mean? My minister, like my poodle. Why, you don't have a minister, unless you're married to one. My minister. No, you have a ministry. <coughs> What's this? If you could get that in your psyche, it'll change the way you live. You say, why is that? Because you can't just live in sin if you have a responsibility to a ministry. Ah. See, uh, in, my situ in my unique situation that I'm in now, I'm a minister. I'm a pastor. But if I lived in open sin, it would disqualify me. Now, just trying to be honest with you, um, years ago I, I had a quantum switch in the way that I walked after the Lord. When I was born again, I was 13, I began my walk with the Lord in discipleship and I tried not to sin because I thought sin would send me to hell. Then I got discipled a little bit and I thought, well, I'm not going to hell, but sin's going to harm me. I don't want to be harmed. And so the motive for walking after the Lord was selfish. But after a few years of discipleship, it flipped. And I began to uh, not want to wantingly sin because I knew that it would hurt him. Now that's a totally different walk. So primarily, I try to walk upright and I try to live what I preach not because I'm a pastor. Because before I'm a pastor, I'm a son of God. And if I didn't pastor a church, I would still be a son of God. You understand what I'm saying? And so, I try to walk in holiness the best I can because I don't want to uh, affect my relationship with Him. But secondarily, I want to walk in holiness because I don't want my sin to affect my relationship with you. I don't want a choice that I make to disqualify me from God's expectations of me or my call. That weighs on me every moment of every day. But what I want to try to tell you tonight is, it should weigh on you too. You should be cognizant of the fact that you have a call. And that your sin will affect your relationship with Him. And your ministry to others. 
Now, what happens is people who are born again, and they're born again, there's no question about it, but they don't ever consider that. So it's real easy for them to fall into sin because they don't consider the fact that their sin is going to affect some of them think about it affecting their walk with God but there's not a big motive there because why? because they know God's going to forgive them and that's why Paul said once you figure that out thank you Cody this is my sound man Ain't not everybody got their own personal sound, man. <laughs> He's a good one, too. Paul said, once you figure out, once you get to that place in discipleship that you figure out God's going to forgive you, matter of fact, He's already forgave you, and you just uh, sin, willfully sin, you better check yourself because you may not be born of God's seed. Because God's seed's incorruptible seed, and it always, never, never, ever does not produce God's fruit. But what I want you to get tonight is to understand your sin will affect your ministry to other people too. We have in the last few years seen some of the greatest ministries on the, on the planet be toppled and destroyed by sin. What's that guy, I just lost his name the other day, he passed away and then they discovered that he owned a whole chain of massage parlors. Uh, Robbie Zacharias or whatever his name was. Yeah, and they weren't, they weren't uh, therapeutic massage parlors, if you know what I mean. All over the world. He kept a secret. Hey, I don't, I don't have no secrets. And I sure don't have a chain of massage parlors. I wouldn't be driving a car 300,000 miles on. I'd be driving one like Ravi. <laughs> but you don't need to worry about Ravi. You need to worry about Yuvi. So let's get into it. Here we go. Verse 2. But I have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. This is basic Christianity 101, ain't it? Are you dishonest? Stop it. Just be honest. Just let your yay be yay and your nay be yay, nay. And just let be known that, you know, you're an honest person. Not handling the Word of God deceitfully. We talked about that last Wednesday night. But by a manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Notice he's talking about their ministry. He's not talking about preaching, is he? He's not talking about uh, building a church, is he? He's talking about his ministry is living upright in front of people, in front of every man's conscience. That's the basic ministry. He's not talking about building a church and having Sunday school. He's talking about living upright, honestly, decently, and in order, and not mishandling the Word of God in people's lives. You have that same ministry. We're all called into the ministry. And if you know that and you recognize it, it'll change the way you live. I can't just live in sin. It would destroy my ministry. You can't just live in sin either. Sin will destroy your ministry too. Are you going to minister to the lady you're cheating on your wife with? Probably not. Can you minister to the employer that you're embezzling from? Probably not. We used to have a guy who went to church here, and he, he told me a joke. Uh, it wasn't a joke, but he told me a story. He thought it was funny, and I, and I, I didn't. He said one time I was working at Phillips, and... He said, the church I was attending to, they had a revival. And he said, I kept inviting all the guys I worked with to the revival. And he said, finally, this one guy said, Keith, I, I, I hear you inviting me, but your life speaks louder than your invitation. Well, Keith didn't have much of a ministry. 
So this is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about you walking upright in front of the people in your life as a ministry to them. So look at verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, and remember what the gospel is. The gospel is the preaching or the teaching of Jesus. He came to earth and he lived a sinless life and he died, like the scripture said, to fulfill prophecy. He was buried three days and he rose again. That's the gospel. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The gospel is the power of salvation. That's why for a person to be born of God's seed, they have to, it's a prerequisite, hear the gospel. Okay? In whom the God, little g, of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So, this little g is, of course, Satan, the God of this world. Well, what does that mean? That means that he's for a period of time in some kind of control. Now remember what I always teach you. The devil, he's not a roaring lion. He walks around like a roaring lion. He's actually uh, pretty powerless, but he's extremely intelligent. For example, the devil did not kill Eve. And Adam, he talked them into killing themselves. All throughout the Bible, you see all the mayhem. You see all the sin. And when you really look at it, the devil is powerless except through deception. See, the Bible says if he could actually come right out and kill you, he'd kill you right now. But God has a restraint on him. So what he tries to do is to get you to kill yourself. And if he can't get you to kill yourself, then he tries to get someone else to kill you. But if he could kill you, he'd kill you. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He can't really destroy you. But he can get you to destroy yourself. So he works through deception. Now, so what did God give you to combat deception? The Word of God. And through faith in God, you can overcome any wile of the devil. But faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So the devil's done a masterful job of getting the Word out of people's hearing. And so... Even if they do go to church, they don't hear the Word of God. They may, they may hear, you know, loud music. They may hear a 15-minute sermonette from a preacherette driving a Corvette. But they don't hear the Word of God. So what I believed when I came here is that God told me He would build His church on the Word of God. But it would, it would be slower because people come and they don't want to hear the Word of God and they go. I mean, I've actually had people say this. One time, two old ladies was leaving a Bible study that I taught in a, in a house and some friends in Pahuska. And one old lady was overheard telling the other lady, I really love his Bible teaching. And the other one said, me too, but he uses way too much Bible. I wore that as a badge. I told the old sea hag, don't know I did. So what? Before Adam's fall, he had a choice. Now stay with me. And God gave him the choice. God always gives you your choice. It's the greatest gift we've been given. That's our free will. It's also the most terrible gift we've been given. 
You're going to live or die on your choice. But we've been hamstrung. We've been handicapped. Adam wasn't. So when Adam was created, he was given a choice. And Adam had a choice. And God gave it to him. He could sin, or he could choose not to. And Adam chose on purpose to sin. Now the Bible's real clear that Eve was tricked. She had a choice too, but she was tricked into her choice, which was a deadly choice, to sin against God. But she was tricked. She did not know what she was doing. She was beguiled. She was wholly and completely seduced. And what she did, she did not realize would kill her. She was talked in to thinking that what she was going to do was good for her. And so she sinned. But she did have a choice. Now, what happened was she chose to listen to a different word than the word of God. But she was deceived. Very clear. And the Bible says that Adam wasn't. So Adam's given a choice as well. So Adam's brilliant. And he weighed out his choice. And I don't think he had any idea what death meant, but he knew it wasn't good. Because all he'd ever been exposed to was God. And so he weighs out his choice. And for years and years and years, I taught it wrongly. He's not passing the buck when he answers to God. He's taking full responsibility for his choice. And that's why God blessed him. He said, You gave me that woman, and you gave me the responsibility of her, and I failed. That's what he's saying. And when God come to him, he said, the woman you gave me, she ate. The only thing that saved his life was that he admits and repents. And, and so when God came to him, he says, God, the woman you gave me, the help meet. And what that means is God, in God's creative ability look down and he sees Adam and he says it's not good for man to be alone now listen God knew all about male and female he done created all the animals he done created male and female every kind of animal bird fish he knew all it wasn't like God's like well I need to make a female why did he say that he's He's acting it out so that you understand the process. So he says, it's not good for this man I've created to be alone. So he says this so that you have the information. I'm going to make him a help meet. And the word help meet means I'm going to create him a being that's a man too with a womb. And she's going to be perfectly fitted, perfect for him. And so he tells Adam that. And you know the story. He comes to Adam and he says, I'm going to create you a help me. A woman that will be perfectly suited for you. And Adam said, well, how? Cool, how are you going to do that? And God said, well, she's going to be perfect for you. So it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And Adam said, well, what can I get for a rib? They don't get any better than that. So when God comes to him, he admits. He said, the woman you gave me, you gave me dominion over, you gave me responsibility for, and I allowed her to eat. 
Now, some people think he was standing there when she ate. Those people are what we call dummies. Because if he had been, that would have been Adam's first sin. So when Adam walks up there, he can tell visibly that something's wrong with her because she's lost the glory of God. Matter of fact, in the Hebrew, it says they both were shining ones. And when she died spiritually, that illumination from inside out was gone. And when Adam walked up there, he's like, what happened? Your light got turned out. Now your cheeks are rosy. Why are you pink? Well, that's because the water that was pumping through her veins had turned to blood. And the blood started killing her. And Adam's like, oh, Lord, you didn't. So Adam had a choice to either sin or not to sin. And he weighed out his choices. And he loved her enough to die for her. So the Bible says he sinned will, willingly and knowingly. But you didn't have a choice. Because of Adam's sin, then every baby that Adam produced and came out of his loins was born into sin. And people run around claiming, trying to tell people, uh, you know, why don't you just quit sinning? And they're lost. Won't you dope heads quit smoking that dope? They're lost. They can't. They don't have a choice. You say, yes they do. They can quit sinning if they... No, they can't. We owe the homosexual community a gratitude for teaching us this theological lesson. Because when the homosexual tries to tell you it's, it's in our nature. They're teaching you Bible. When the homosexual tells you we're born that way, they're theologically correct. Now when they cross the line and say God created us that way, they're wrong. But you don't have a choice. You're born in the sin. If you think you do, you're crazy. Now, you say, well, what is he talking about? We don't have a, I'm not a homosexual. You know why you're not? Because you've never entertained that ideal. But you've got other sin on your record. And you can't stop. You're a slave to sin. You're born into sin. It's in your nature. It's in your DNA. It's in your blood. You just start sin. First thing you do, start bawling and crying for your way. You won't back in there. And they don't stop bawling and crying until they die. Until, until that part of you that was born dead is born of God. Then, you have within you a part of you that can't sin. And the struggle goes between that part of you that Colossians says, God cut away from the part of you that cannot not sin. And now you have a struggle. Who's going to win? And eventually you win. Your spirit man, born of God, wins the ultimate battle when you lay down the flesh and, and it rots. That's the winning. That's when you win. But until then, you don't have a choice. Now you can choose your sin and you can choose the quantity of it, but you can't choose not to sin until... You're born of God. And then Paul says, you're no longer a slave to sin. Matter of fact, he says you're free from sin. Not free to sin. Free from it. But your flesh still has that old blood pumping in it. So that's the struggle. 
And one day, you'll lay it down. So when the homosexual says, hey, it's in my nature, you better believe it. And the reason why I'm not a homosexual, the devil would be just tickled pink if I was. I've never entertained the thought. That avenue's road closed. I don't entertain it. Now gluttony, I've been down that road a long, long way. Selfishness, I'm the king. At the selfishness uh, meetings, I, I'm the president. But, but I had this conversation the other day with a homosexual. Let me have it with you for a second. What would you consider would be the worst sin? Two queers having sex? Or, now what sin would you consider would be the worst sin? Or the most damaging sin? Or the most the devil would get for his money. Two queers having sex? Or a born again man or woman having sex outside of marriage and destroying their marriage, their spouse, their children, and their grandchildren? What do you think the devil would get more money for the bang for the buck? Listen, homosexuality is a sexual sin because it's not in the covenant of marriage and their covenant of God. Any sex outside of that covenant is a sin in God's eyes. We just look down on homosexuals because we like to point out sins that we can't fathom. So, look at this. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. That would be a great start to a ministry. To become servants for Jesus' sake. Look at verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. It changes you. It makes you want to share your ministry to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's talking about a ministry of just sharing the light of God. He's not said a thing about preaching. He's not said a thing about the church. He's just talking about individuals having a ministry. He's not talking about pastoral, evangelistic. He's just talking about you. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You have, you have within you the power of God to share with other people that you might give it away. How frustrating it must be for God to, to put His Spirit into individuals and to cut away their soul from their flesh, birth their spirit, and then they just consume it on themselves. We are troubled on every side. Well, I guess he was. Yet not distressed. Oh, how can you be that? Well, the Bible talks about a, a, a peace that nobody can explain, but all can enjoy. And some of you, if, if we had time, you'd stand to your feet and tell us about times in your life that should have destroyed you, yet you had this peace that you can't explain. Well, that's what he's talking about. He, he's troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. So... You, you, you don't let things get to the point where they put you in despair because that's what they're designed to do. Don't let 
the best laid plans of your enemy come to pass. At least fight them. So, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And he's talking about there of you dying in the body. That you would uh, crucify your flesh. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. So we live as of to Christ. And we die as the crucified Christ. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. You know, I, I've been saying this a lot. We talk about, people always say, well, our battle is spiritual. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against, yeah, I know all that. But the spiritual always manifests in the flesh. <laughs> it may be spiritually driven, and it may be all spiritual, but it'll manifest in your face. And you're going to have to have uh, your mortal body crucified to the place that you can overcome it. And that's what he's talking about. For we which, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. You speak what you believe, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. You have that hope. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, so he has this ministry. He's not talked a thing about preaching. But they don't quit because they have this ministry, this call that drives them to live a life of sacrifice for them, to live a life that ministers to them. They stay away from dishonesty and other sin because it would destroy their ministry. Why? They faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So here's another verse talking about this two parts of you. You have an inner man and an outward man. And the thing that you need to be working on until the day you die is building up your inner man and tearing down your outer man. Okay? So you're building up your spiritual man. For our light afflictions, now, Paul throws that out there, and um, he was not lightly afflicted. Uh, he gets some afflictions after this was written, but just to give you the breakdown one more time, he was beaten by another man with a scourge five times, 40 stripes. Let's do the math. That's 200 stripes. Now, not all at the same time, he was beaten 40 whacks with a pole, like a crappie pole. How would you like that from another man? Three times 40 stripes. So three times 40, that's 120. Now we're up to 320 stripes. He was stoned to death once. He was shipwrecked three times. This is some affliction. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Who is this guy? He says this all through his Pauline epistle. The persecution is working on you to make you better. <laughs> the starvation makes you hungrier for God's word. No, it makes you hungry for Sonic. <laughs> the beatings, the beatings, they're, they're working for you. Oh, who is this guy? While we look not at the things which are seen. Oh, now we know his secret. Quit looking at the things you can see because they're temporal. 
Lay up your treasures in heaven. I know it's hard. Life's hard. <laughs> what John Wayne say? Life's hard. And it's harder if you're stupid. <laughs> life's hard. I mean, is anybody in here stand to your feet and say, my life's been easy? It's hard. And, and it's hard to live by faith. Because we're so driven by what we see. And it takes a walk of faith to develop a life of faith. And the reason why is because after a while, you have proof. You have evidence. And you have proof of what you can't see. How does that work? It works like this. Some of you guys have been married for a long, long time. And some of you have great marriages. And you got a lifetime of proof that that person loves you. And maybe they leave in the morning and they go to their job. And you don't have a question in your mind. You have faith that no matter where they're at, no matter what they're doing, you know they love you. Why? Because over the years, you've proved it o'er and o'er. And you start out walking with God, and you're not sure. It's new. And you think it's strange. God wants me to believe, but... It's hard. I, I don't know for sure. And then after years and years of Him showing you, bringing you through different situations, you thought you'd never make it, and you did. And you got back on the other side, and you look back, and He is with you all the time. And after years and years of that reassurance, and that finding Him faithful, and that over and over and over, your faith is brought to substance. Then sometimes in those dry places, when maybe you don't hear from Him, you don't doubt that He loves you. Because you've proved Him o'er and o'er. And you get to a place, you don't need to see something. You know something. That'll bring you through the darkest times. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Some of you don't have 10 years left. I'm, I don't mean the one to break it to you. I, when I first got here 11 and a half years ago, I preached a sermon and I said, let's do something for God. You know, and the five people were sitting there, they're just about to die. I said, come on, man, let's do something for God. I said, uh, in America, the national average for a male is 70 years. And when I got here 11 and a half years ago, I'd added it up. I said, come on. And I reached in there and I grabbed old Patty Reese and I shook her false teeth out. And I said, wake up. I said, I only got 1,500 Sundays here if I live to be 70. And they sat up in their chair. And I said, that brought it home, didn't it? 1,500 Sundays. Well, I got less than a thousand now. The time's just flying by. And some of you in here don't have 10 years left. You guys all know my situation, and I'm trying to make it through it, and I think, what am I going to do? It don't matter what I do, I don't have 15 or 20 years left.
So what are you going to do? Pine away for the rest of your life? No. If I can help you in anything, for you that are sitting here thinking, hey, he's probably right. Go out with a bang. Leave this place tonight. Take me to Freddy's and I'll talk to you the rest of the night. And let's figure you out a ministry. And if you got 10 years or 10 days, you go out in a blaze of glory because you're not going to beat it. But the greatest thing that will ever happen to you on this earth is when you lay that body down. I know you don't think it will be, but when it's like getting laid off from Summer Jay. After you go through it and you get by it, you think, Hallelujah, that's the greatest thing ever happened to me. Watch. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We're living our lives together. And it won't stop here. It'll stop for some of us periodically, but we'll pick it back up on the other side. And for eternity, we'll have a relationship together. So tonight, let's do something! I only got 900 and something Sundays left. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Oh, I hope every person here, every person watching understands they have a ministry too. They may be derelict in their ministry. What greater calling than to be a part of the army of God? God, help us to be on task and on purpose living for you. And not to take your name in vain. Thank you for another great day here at Matoka Baptist Church. Thank you for your spirit that we felt here all day long. Thank you for these dear people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks.